Um, so it's, it's our pleasure to have uh, Darren Glass from Gettysburg College. He's going to talk to us about uh, decomposing Jacobians of perhaps. at various places where and you might know that a lot of my research you know, has been interested in the question about what is the relationship between the automorphism group of a curve and its Jacobian. Um, so again, those of you, if you who have seen me give talks or you might have seen a theorem that says that, well, generic curves of any P rank have no non-trivial automorphism or various things about subspaces of curves with P ranks. Don't really worry too much about what these slides say. Or Here's a really you know, tedious one to read, but that gives you some restriction, describes various restrictions about the relationship between the automorphism group of a curve and its P rank as what I've normally given talks on, although looking at results about A numbers and X dot or stratas and various of these other fancy things. Um, a couple of years ago, actually, David was the one who introduced me to this idea of an analogy between algebraic curves and graph theory, and this analogy between it, which was appealing to me for a few reasons. One is being at a small liberal arts college where I'm encouraged in various ways to do a lot of research with students, or at least research that students can understand. Trying to describe P ranks and ectal ord strata isn't going to happen. And of course, the same is true for colloquium audiences. That you know, it's nice to be able to have something a little more concrete. And so I got very interested in this analogy about the Jacobians of graphs, which of course leads to the first question, which is, if I, there we go, what do I mean by the Jacobian of a graph? What does that even mean? Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm assuming that people don't know, even though I know a few of you do know. Um, so. To recall, and again, I'm not really, you know, it's okay if you've never seen this before, but on a curve, you can define the Jacobian by first thinking about divisors on the curve, and the divisors just take a bunch of points, normally a finite set, a finite set of points on the curve, associate to each one of those points an integer, and, well, I guess the way I have it phrased is assign an integer to all of those points, but assume they're all, almost always zero. Um, and then the degree of a divisor on a curve is just the, the sum of all of, actually I added in the times x there. So anyway, it's just the sum of the value of the divisor at all of the points. And the Jacobian is the set of divisors of degree zero on the curve up to some equivalence rate relation, right? A linear equivalence that has to do with how lines intersect. And that's a graph, that's a group. You can define the Jacobian as a group that you associate to the curve in this way. Well, to define the Jacobian of a graph, we pretty much want to do the exact same thing. So instead of a divisor on a curve, let's define the divisor on a graph. And then let's let that formal sum, instead of ranging over all the points on the curve, let's just look over all the vertices. So for each vertex of the graph, let's assign to it a number where almost, well, I guess I left in the all but finitely many, but in this talk, I'm going to always assume my graph is a finite graph, so it has a finite number of vertices. And then similarly, we can define the divisor, and oh good, I left the typo in. Um, <laughs> you know, I translated the typo exactly. Uh, the, the degree of the divisor is just the sum of the value of that integer on every point. And then the Jacobian of the graph will still be the set of divisors of degree zero up to an equivalence relation. Now, in this case, I actually should tell you what that equivalence relation is. Um, and a way that you know, a lot of people in literature like to do this, which is, a, you know, I think, a nice way of entering into it, is thinking of what's called a chip firing game on the graph. So if you have your graph, you have a finite graph, and you have, think of the divisor as associating each, to each vertex a number, and think of that as a number of chips. And then what the equivalence relation says is for each vertex, you can either fire that chip, meaning take one, ver one chip, fire that vertex, meaning take one chip from, each of the, from the vertex and send it to each of the neighbors, or do the opposite of that, borrow chips. So as an example, let's say here's your graph and your divisor is these integers. Well, I might say, well, I want to choose this vertex and I want to fire it. What does that mean? That means I want to send one chip over to there and one chip up to there. So I get that new divisor. And then let's say I want to choose another chip, another vertex to fire. I think it's this one. 
and let's choose that one. So now I'm going to take three of those chips, and we can go negative here, and send one back, one up, and one over. And there we go. And this is the equivalence relation that I want to think of. So two divisors are equivalent if you can get from one to the other by a series of these firings. And often we talk about the borrowing sort of the opposite. Uh, you know, it's a pretty easy exercise to convince yourself that borrowing from one is just the same as firing all of the others. So you can just, yeah, you can really just use the firing version. More formally, if G is, if your graph has n vertices, then well, the set of divisors on G you can think of as just z to the n, and set this all up in terms of some linear algebra. The divisors of degree 0, to use the you know, algebraic geometry notation, is just z to the n minus 1. You're just giving a restriction that the sum is 0. And then you can define this, the Jacobian, right, is up, that up to some equivalence relation. And you can define that equivalence relation in terms of the Laplacian matrix of a graph. What is the Laplacian matrix? Well, it just is, you basically you take the adjacency matrix, minus, and then on the diagonal you put in negative the degree of the vertex. So I'll show an example in a second. Um, and the Jacobian will just be z to the n modulo you know, this matrix, this, this, the, this matrix where the, you're thinking it's acting out in terms of integers. Um, Often, when you prove results about this, you actually look at z n minus 1, where you're restricting yourself just to the case of divisors of degree 0, modulo L star, that's called the reduced Laplacian. Basically, that just says, choose any row and column and cut them out of the Laplacian, and you can modulo out by that instead. Um, so, but for our purposes, we'll actually be thinking in terms of z n mod L. So, for example, for this graph, Again, if you look at, you know, this is basically the adjacency matrix where you have a one, you know, well, on off diagonal entries, it tells you the number of edges between two vertices. I did these, well, I guess it doesn't matter, either clockwise or counterclockwise. So from the first vertex, it has a degree of three, so you put a negative three in the diagonal entry, and then you have one edge to each of the other vertices, so you get the one, one, one. From the second vertex, you have a degree of 2, so you have a negative 2 there, and it's connected to the first and the third, etc. Um, it's well known that the Laplacian of a finite connected graph is an n by n matrix with rank n minus 1. Um, and we often can compute this Jacobian, we can compute this z to the n modulo L by looking at the Smith normal form of the, of the matrix L. Uh, now, I've given a few talks on this topic, and uh, I get to the Smith normal form and ask if people know what it is, and sometimes everyone in the room is like, oh yeah, that's trivial, everyone knows that. And other times everyone's like, I've never heard of this before. So, how many of you have ever heard of the Smith normal form? I, well, you know, I, I wouldn't mind being reminded. So I will remind you either way, <laughs> but <laughs> I I'm just clue. curious, because it was something I had never heard of before I started this work you know, a year or two ago. The idea of a Smith normal form is actually really cool. The idea is that for any matrix with integer entries, and you can actually do this as algebraic integers in any number field. If you have any matrix with integer entries, you can diagonalize it to another matrix with just diagonally integer entries by multiplying by something, you know, by some invertible matrix on the left and some other invertible matrix on the right. And you can get this in exactly this way. Uh, I mean, I'll show you an, an, an example in a minute. But the idea is that that diagonal matrix is called the Smith normal form. And it's a nice result. I mean, the reason you're interested in this is because z to the n mod a is exactly the direct sum of, or is isomorphic to z mod those diagonal entries. So for example, if you go back to, sorry. So we'll see this in a second, but the, the z to the n mod a, which is of course the Jacobian in the case where a is the Laplacian matrix, is exactly, you can read it off by just looking at z mod each of those diagonal entries one at a time. So, let me just show an example here. So this was our Laplacian matrix of that earlier example. By playing with it a little bit, you can, you can figure out, or you know, there's nice algorithms to do this, that L can be decomposed as 
two invertible matrices, and um, that one's obviously invertible over the integers, that one's a little less obviously, if it is, on either side of a diagonal matrix. And what this tells us is that the Jacobian of G, Z to the fourth modulo the image of this lattice, of this matrix, is exactly z mod 1 plus z mod 1 plus z mod 8, well, plus a copy of z, and you normally, I mean, that sort of is the thing that says all the entries have to add up to 0. Um, so, so that the Jacobian in this case is isomorphic to z mod 8. Do non-square matrices have uh, Smith normal forms? Non-square matrices still have Smith normal forms. Because I think this comes up in classification of finite abelian groups, or already abelian groups for that matter, I think, or finally generated abelian groups. It, it probably does. Uh, I think in situations where you have more generators and relations or something, you, you get this non-square matrix and then you go to work on that. So it is still, right, you still will always have an integer diagonal matrix where you can do each side. And, but no, it comes up all the time. I, I guess this is something that topologists use a lot in terms of, or is my understanding. Um, you actually get you know, a lot more information by knowing what the left-hand matrix is. Uh, which is just, this is a you know, fun thing that I didn't know. If you want to ask the question, what, it, what vectors can be written as integral combinations of these column vectors, right? So this isn't quite the column space of traditional linear algebra where you're allowed you know, rational coefficients or comp real coefficients, but integer combinations, then you can read that right off of these two matrices. The first line tells you that well, 0 times the first entry plus the second entry plus, so in other words, the second entry has to be a multiple of 1. Okay, so that doesn't actually tell you anything potentially. The second row tells you that the third entry minus the fourth entry has to be a multiple of 1. Okay, that doesn't give you any information. The third row tells you that negative the first minus the second plus the third has to be a multiple of 8. And the fourth one tells you that the sum of all four has to be a multiple of 0, so it has to be 0. So the only vectors that can be written as integer combinations of these four, well, and it's pretty easy to see one direction of this, the, yeah, that if that is, you are an integer combination of these four, then the sum of the four entries is zero, because it's true for all of those. And you can check pretty easily the other one, that minus this, minus two this, plus three that, better be a multiple of eight. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's zero. Yeah. And that's an if and only if. And this is actually a pretty easy a linear algebra exercise that if you can decompose it, you can read that off. But this comes in very handy, right, if you are in a situation where you want to know, when you have vectors and you want to know what can be written as integer combinations of these. I think well, if this is. Is that on the right always upper triangular, or is that? No, that's special about this case. Oh. That's, I mean, I, I should say that, right, often you can force it to be. I mean, that this. The middle matrix is more or less unique. If you assume up to units and up to, if you assume that like the entries divide each other like in the finite theorem, you know, fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, then the middle is unique, but the two side matrices aren't unique, and you can shift them in various ways. Um, so, so, I think the algorithm that Mathematica has for solving Smith normal forms does, if possible, give you an upper triangular, and I think you can often get one. I did, but. So anyway, you know, the take-home message of this, that is, of this piece of this is, there are straightforward algorithms for computing Jacobians, right? So all you need to do is compute these Smith normal forms. And in fact, there's actually a very easy way to, easy again in quotes, way of doing it in terms of if you can do GCDs and determinants, like, so, the, the, I'm not sure I remember this. The top entry, the top left one, is the GCD of all the entries in here. The second one is the GCD of the determinants of all two by two minors, three by three minors, etc. So, if you can compute GCDs and determinants really quickly, then you can do this. Now, that gets really hairy as these things get fast. And it doesn't give you any information about the U matrix, which you often want to have. So there, if, you hand, if you hand Mathematica a graph, well, more, if you do the work to put it in 
you know, to write down this matrix, it can very easily compute for you what the Smith normal form and therefore what the Jacobian is. Um, if you have a small number of things. Numbers. Uh, a couple other facts about Jacobians. The order of the Jacobian of a graph is equal to the number of spanning trees on the graph. It's a nice theorem in combinatorics. It's also equal to the determinant of the Laplacian. I guess I, I should have said that. Um, so if you can count the number of spanning trees, you know, the Jacobian is a finite abelian group of, and you know the order, so therefore, well, you only have a few options, um, depending on the order. Um, so this is a useful thing that comes up. <clears throat> it's conjectured that the Jacobian of a generic graph is cyclic. Of course, what do we mean by a generic graph? You have a finite number of graphs with finite, any fixed number of vertices. You make, can make this precise. Um, I believe this is due to Biggs, actually, is the one who conjectured this. Um, and has there's some partial results along this way. Um, and of course, if you know the order and you know it's cyclic, then you're done. Uh, the Jacobian of an n cycle is z mod n. This, of course, is pretty easy to see that the number of spanning trees, if you have you know, your triangle, is three, because you can just leave off any edge. The fact that it's cyclic is also fairly easy to prove in a couple of different ways, one of which is Uh, another theorem that is, I guess, fairly, well, maybe not obvious, but not that, you know, certainly plausible given the other things I've said, is that if you just add a leaf, if I take this and just add a leaf to it, that's not going to change the Jacobian. Uh, and again, that's, you can prove that in terms of matrices, but also clearly that doesn't change the number of spanning trees, and so it's at least a plausible um, in particular, the Jacobian of a tree itself is trivial. So I guess that in particular might have actually originally been with the number of spanning trees piece. But if you have a tree, the Jacobian is trivial. Again, you can prove that in terms of the matrices, although once you have that second bullet point, that follows immediately. So Jacobians of graphs are interesting. Counting number of spanning trees are interesting for a number of reasons that to combinatorial people. But in recent years, people have started to really explore this an, an analogy between Jacobians of curves and Jacobians of graphs. Um, so people have started to think, well, maybe these two things are related. And it's actually really interesting because, well, we'll see in a second, there's an analogy, but it's not a direct correspondence. It's not like the theory, the theory just picks up and translates directly. Baker and Noreen were to have a couple of papers that were two of them were, were some of the first ones that really made this precise, this analogy, where they suggested that the analog of holomorphic maps, that if you have a Riemann surface or a curve and you want to look at sort of the, the maps on it, should be harmonic morphisms of graphs. So what is a harmonic morphism? Well, harmonic morphism, well, the way I'm going to phrase it is, a group acts harmonically on a graph if no element of the group fixes any directed edge. Okay, so Baker and Noreen actually phrased it in terms of morphisms and in terms of if you have a morphism between two graphs, a harmonic morphism is one that the number of edges that lift from any other edge is constant, something like that. Scott Corey, I think, was the first to really frame it this way, which is just to say that, right, that if you have any edge on your graph can't be fixed in a directed way. Um, if the two vertices are fixed, there can't be an edge between. Um, so, right, I put it there in the stabilizer. Um, so, to sort of tell you a little about how this analogy works, well, you, you might remember, you know, for in algebraic geometry, the, there's the Hurwitz bound that says that if you have any group that acts on a curve of genus G, that the size of that group is less than or equal to 84 times G minus 1. And this gives an upper bound on the number of automorphisms that a group can have. Um, in characteristic zero. Um, I think it could work for a torus. Uh, yeah, I think actually, I, probably, I think G has to be greater than two, greater than or equal to two is probably what I meant to have up there. Yeah, no thanks. That, certainly this is not true for G equals zero or one. Um, Scott Corey proved that a similar result holds for gra in the graph theoretic setting. That if you have a group that acts harmonically on a graph, then the group has at most six times g minus one elements. Um, and in fact, this is a, um, 
this is a strict bound in the sense that there's an infinite number of G of genera for which you can construct a graph that has exactly this. So how do you uh, define the, the genus for a graph? Ah, that's a good, that, that's a really good question. That I'm defining the genus of a graph as not in the sense that some people do. I'm defining it to be the number of holes or, so it's uh, V minus E plus one. Am I ever right about this? Don't move the camera over until I'm sure I'm right oh, about this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that comes out zero for a tree. As so for a tree, it's genus zero. For something with the one hole, it's genus one. So right. So it's the genus of the graph. Yeah. So right. Some often in graph theory, the term genus is used for something else. It's for the minimal genus of a surface that you can draw the graph on. Does that sound right to me? I think this, this thing of yours is sometimes called the nullity. Right. So graph theorists call this the nullity. Exactly. But it, it, it ha it's the thing that plays the same role as genus of genus do that genus does. And again, in g greater than or equal to two, or I don't remember. Uh, well, surely certainly g equals uh, zero. Right. Certainly not g equals zero. And certainly not g equals one. So yes. Well, I'm just trying to think of something that could act harmonically on a tree, or maybe the Arctic. Well, it could be less than. Well, it can't be less than. That's why I was. That's why I said certainly. Uh, so it's whether it's g equals one. I'd have to think. Um, well, you could have a you could have a loop, and you could you know you could flip it this way, and that would be. Sure. Yeah. Action. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So it must be g greater than equal. Um, so, you know, I mean, my idea in putting this up here is to show that somehow you get a very similar result asymptotically in a sense, but, you know, big O, but not, you know, it's not actually the same result. Um, in fact, Corey actually does prove more. He proves that for any genus, the maximal group will either be 6 times g minus 1 or 4 times g minus 1. And then you get both of those cases in. Um, another theorem that is, you know, painfully familiar to a lot of algebraic geometers, it has to do with if you have two surfaces and a map between them, or if one's a, I think I, yeah, I phrase all terms of group actions on the quotient, if you mod out by a group, then there's a relationship between the genus of the, of the original and the genus of its quotient. <clears throat> right, where 2 times 2g two minus 2 on top is n, the order of the group, times 2g minus 2 on the bottom, plus some ramification divisor. That, in, if you're in the characteristic zero world, is a fairly easy thing to just describe. Um, Baker and Marine show that for the graph theory sense, and again using the genus in this way, you get a very similar looking result, but not quite the same. That the genus of the top will be n times, or 2g minus 2 on top, is n times 2g minus 2 on the bottom plus something. And that something I'm going to dive into in a second to say exactly what this is, but it is the ramification divisor that describes the ramification of this map. Um, notice that, of course, right, it, 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 it's, this part is very similar, but here you have a 2 times something minus 1, and you get this extra term. So something's different, even though it's clearly you know, morally very similar. Um, just to say a little bit more about what this, this baker green ramification divisor is, well, the M sub phi is what, what they call horizontal ramification. And that's basically just the size of the inertia group, the number of elements in the group that fix it. So that's actually very similar to the, the way that we think about and talk about ramification in the algebraic curve sense. Um, but again, multiplied by 2. And then we also have these V sub phi's, this vertical ramification. And the vertical ramification is just the number of edges that just get totally collapsed to a given, to a given vertex. So if you have, you know, say, I'm gonna draw this actual exact picture in a minute. But if you think of this map where you're just reflecting over that point or that line, 
you're doing that reflection as the quotient, then here, this edge somehow gets totally sucked up into that vertex. Because both things here get moved to go to that vertex, and the edge just totally goes away. So they would describe this as what's called vertical ramification. That you get some extra ramification coming there that contributes to this ramification device. Um, Scott Corey, they have one interpretation of vertical ramification in terms of the curves. Scott Corey um, has a theory, or a con uh, it's not precise enough to be a conjecture, but that this is somehow really has to do with extension of base fields. That really, the, all of this stuff is not really about Riemann surfaces, but is about curves defined over various fields. And that the vertical ramification has to do with when you enlarge it or you know, your base field. Um, yeah, it's not really precise enough to be a conjecture, but and he has some evidence for that in one of his papers. So excuse me, yeah. what does the, uh, the phi stand for? Oh, know. sorry, phi is just the, is the quotient map. Okay. I'm sorry, thanks. Okay. Right. Yeah, phi is just the quotient map. This is all just graph theory, right? So, yeah. so this is all just about the, you know, the graph and what's going on there. But how the base fields? Oh, so I, again, again, I could point you to, the, to Scott's paper where he goes into this. He's basically, right, so Baker and Noreen have the, their whole idea is that the, the, the graph theory setting, here I'll move so David doesn't have to move. Uh, uh, the graph theory setting should be analogous to complex manifolds, right? That's their idea. And what he's Scott's suggesting is that actually it might be over different kinds of, you know, not algebraically closed, but where you are over different number fields and somehow how far what your vertical ramification has to do with those extensions. What year was that paper? Very recent. I, I can find the actual exact paper. Um, I'll pop up on archives. So, yeah, it's definitely on archive. Um, so there's another theorem in algebraic geometry that I use a lot in my work, which is due to Connie and Rosen. And this is actually just a, a, a corollary of their result. Their result is bigger than this. But it says, <clears throat> if you have an algebraic curve with a dihedral group acting on it, then, and let's assume, well, actually, I, I don't know, should, I should take that um, So forget that part of the quotient for right this second. Um, if you have any curve with a dihedral group acting on it, then you get this relationship between the Jacobians. That the Jacobian of the top curve plus twice the Jacobian of the full quotient, so as I originally had written it, that was going to be a tree, so we could ignore that, is the sum of the Jacobians of the three quotients. So, Amy's drawing with her fingers, you somehow get Right, a sigma 1, a sigma 2, x mod sigma 1, x mod sigma 2, the full dihedral group dn generated by those, and x mod sigma 1, sigma 2. And that the Jacobian of the top plus twice the Jacobian of the bottom is the sum of these three Jacobians in the middle. It's isogenous to the sum. And they prove this. That actually, it's not just for these groups, for dihedral groups. Their result's a little more general. Um, but for today, I, I just need the result for dihedral groups. And so the question that I will, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about is, is the question of, well, is this theorem possibly true, or is a version of this theorem possibly true in the setting of graph theory? Um, I first sort of came across this question. As I mentioned, one of the reasons I like this Jacobian of graph stuff is that I, I can work on it with students. And I had a student who was just playing with the Jacobian of this graph right here. And one of the things that we noticed after time is, well, if you think about, let's let sigma 1 be the reflection that I already drew here. The quotient by that reflection is this graph. Well, we've already said that the Jacobian of a triangle is z mod 3. Adding this leaf doesn't change that. So the Jacobian of this thing is z mod 3. The Jacobian of g modulo that action is z mod 3. Similarly, if you choose a different reflection, 
you also get a z mod 3. Well, if you think about the product of those two reflections, right, just the easy group theory, that's just a rotation. What happens when you take this graph and mod out by a rotation? Well, the three outside vertices all become the same, the three inside vertices all become the same, and you have two edges between them. So what are you left with? You're left with that, and we know the Jacobian of that is z mod 2. And then you can either throw into Mathematica or do in various other ways and figure out that the Jacobian of the whole graph is z mod 3 plus z mod 3 plus z mod 6. Well, that's not quite the sum of these three things, but it's sure close. Right, z mod 3, z mod 3, z mod 2, z mod 6. And somehow that's not too surprising, because I said that Connie and Rosen relationship was isogeny. That means that you, have a, you can have a finite kernel. Right, these things are the same up to a finite kernel. Well, there's, this, is, this is the sum of these three things up to a finite kernel. <laughs> so the Kani and Rosen theorem seems to hold in this example. And in fact, you can prove that this works for what we call flower graphs, which basically are take any polynomial you want and throw the same polynomial all the way around it. So you know, take a square and draw pentagons all the way around it. Or whatever. Polygon, what do you say, polynomial? I said pi, yes, polygon, thank you. I was wondering why you were curious, why you were confused when I said Take, put any polygon in the middle, put any other poly, the same thing all the way around it, and you get something very similar. You get it very directly. So this works for this infinite family of graphs. And in fact, there are other infinite families of graphs we found. And so we found lots of examples where this works. And, and, and then when I was in, in Oaxaca working with Creole Moreno, uh, we found a counterexample. So here's a graph, and I won't take the time to go too far in depth into it, but the idea is that the group action, I claim that D3 acts on this, but it's not in any nice way, it's in sort of an ugly way. Let's let one involution basically say, let's switch these two vertices, and then here let's switch these edges and switch these edges, because we want it to be harmonic, so we can't fix any edge. So switch the x2 and the x3 and move those, those edges around. And similarly, let's sigma 2, what do I do here? I switch the top two, x1 and x2, and switch these edges. And those are both harmonic. And if you think about that and play with the, you know, writing down how the group acts here, you'll see that sigma 1, sigma 2, the product of the two, is just going to move x1 to x2 to x3 and sort of in a cycle. So you get a d3 action. Um, and in fact, if you then go through and so yes, yeah, so the group generated by those two involutions is a D3. And in fact, if you think about how the quotient acts, well, the quotient by the sigma one is was something like that. And you can again throw that into Mathematica or do it out by hand and see that the Jacobian of this graph is a z mod 12. You're going to get something similar for the g mod sigma 2. If you do the quotient, then you're going to get, well, that one's fairly easy to see. If you do the product, rather, you're going to, you can figure out that Jacobian. And you can then compute the Jacobian of the whole big ugly thing and see that, lo and behold, you don't get, I mean, Clearly, there's something similar here, but you have one z mod 12, and you should have two, and it's, it's not quite right. Clearly, there's a relationship here, but it's not as nice as Connie and Rosen would suggest in the, in the case of curves. So we were looking at this example, trying to figure out what it was that what was going wrong. Why wasn't this example working? Not that we had any real reason to think it should, but. And the, and the quotient by the whole group is a tree. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the quotient by the whole group is going to you know, coalesce all of x1, x2, and x3. And, oh, right, so and you can also see yeah. No, good. Yeah. Now, your philosophy about multiple edges in graphs is that they're going to come in anyway under these quotients, so you might as well allow them in. The exactly. Okay. Right. No. So you can actually you can actually construct an example without multiple edges by just having six things here. Right, but if you just you know split these and split those and split those, then it, but somehow then writing down the group actions was uglier. <laughs> but so uh, that was actually our first thought was maybe it's about the multiple edges, and now we can come up with an example where that doesn't work. But yes, that is our philosophy. 
Um, so we're thinking, well, what's going on? Well, the problem here, in a sense, is that every element of the group is fixing the two endpoints, right? Well, therefore, the inertia group at those points, or the stabilizer group, is everything. Well, but this, in particular, it's not cyclic. Well, but those of you who know algebraic geometers know that that can't happen in the complex manifold case. You can't, Avianca's lemma says, you can't, inertia groups have to be cyclic, except for the wild ramification, which complex numbers don't have. So this situation can't occur. So we are hopeful that maybe that was the real problem. And you know, again, this isn't a precise statement, but somehow uh, we think that that's the problem. The precise statement I will make is that we can prove what we're going to prove in a few minutes in the case where the inertia groups are either trivial or Z mod 2. So I, I, we're not, sh and, and in fact, our methods, and I'll, I'll try to hint to this when the time comes, have no hope of working if the inertia group is even other cyclic groups. So, but our idea is that that's one of the places where this difference is between the curves and the graph set. So, in other words, we're going to look at graphs that have a dihedral action where all of the orbits either have endpoints or two endpoints. So you can't have any more coalescing than that. So as a family of examples, if you have any group that has an involution acting on it, well, just paste together a bunch of copies of that. And I write this down a little more precisely. But the idea is if you have a nice involution here that switches A and B, we can just paste three copies of that together by identifying the A and B in each of the copies. Or if that's your graph that has an A and a B, then we can paste together four copies of it in, in a circle. So I guess Creole has said graph theorists have a name for this that I'm not remembering. It's similar to the tensor product of two graphs. But anyway, we're of a site tensoring with the site. Um, so that's one example where every orbit will have either n points, four points in this case, or eight points. Somehow, depending on if the action, if the involution fixes or is you know, A and B. Okay. Another example of a kind of graph where you have these orbit conditions are circulant graphs. Circulant graphs are just graphs where you take n points, put them in a circle, and just sort of apply the same relationship. So in other words, C813 says every, you know, have eight vertices, and each vertex is connected to the thing that is one in each direction and three in each direction. Or nine things and two in each direction and four in each direction. Two, three, and six. These are called circulant graphs. Again, well, there's only n points to begin with, so every orbit, there's only one orbit, has n points. And somehow, all of the graphs that have this condition, that the orbits have either n or two n points, somehow are a combination of these two things, right? That either you the, take the same graph and paste a bunch of copies in a circle, and then maybe make some other connections between the points, or overlay some circular graphs onto it. Um, and so somehow we felt like if we could solve these two cases, then the other things would fall. Um, so the, I think the last sort of t technical definition I need is the idea of a pullback if we have this, if we have a divisors. So if you have two graphs and G maps to H is a harmonic map, and we're always going to be thinking of quotients by harmonic morphisms or groups acting, um, but this is more generally defined. Then if you have a divisor on the downstairs graph, you can pull it back just by multiplying each thing by whatever that m phi was, right? Remember that was the horizontal, no, yeah, the horizontal ramification. So for example, back to this case, uh, if we have our, this graph and this graph, well, if you think about what the inertia groups of these sort of m phi's are in each case, well, for these vertices, they're one, and for the top and bottom, they're two. This is so right that these two vertices Somehow, when you pull it back, you get two copies of that. That's kind of the philosophy behind this. Um, so, how the pullback morphism works, it says, take any divisor over here, just pull it back by saying, if, well, multiply by two, where we had the m phi, the horizontal ramification would be two, everywhere else just be one. So, the pullback of this divisor is this divisor. 
Um, it's fairly straightforward to convince yourself that if you start with a divisor of degree zero, the pullback will also be degree zero, because somehow you're pulling it back to that number of copies of it, the inertia groups. Um, similarly, it's going to be closed. The set of pullbacks of de degree zero are closed under addition. Uh, if a divisor is equivalent to the identity, if, you know, if you're trivial in the downstairs Jacobian, then pull it back. You're still going to be trivial. But this, you, know, you can convince yourself of. The surprising thing is that this is an if and only if statement. So in other words, what Baker, one thing that Baker and Noreen are able to prove is that the pullback map is injective. This isn't true for algebraic curves. Um, you can still define a pullback on Jacobians, but in general, it's not injective. And right, there's a lot of work done to try to get around that fact. Uh, this is one way that the graph theory setting is really nice. So in other words, I'm going to use some abusive notation to say that uh, if we have a harmonic automorphism, then the Jacobian of the quotient is inside as a subgroup of the Jacobian of the big thing. Uh, again, what I really mean by this is the pullback of elements that are in the Jacobian here are in the Jaco you know, gives a subgroup of this. But I'm going to not keep saying the word pullback. Um, what I'm interested in is, of course, the pullback. So in other words, what that's saying is the Jacobian here is a subgroup of x, the Jacobian here is a subgroup of the Jacobian, and the Jacobian here is a subgroup. I, what I really want to do is say, well, what about the sum of those three? Is the sum of those three in the Jacobian in there? Well, you know that these pullbacks, though, are distinct images. That's exactly the question, right? So no, David, that's exactly the question, right? That we have these three things that are all subgroups. I want to claim that the direct sum of them is. So in other words, I want to claim something about disjointness, right? And that's exactly the question. So let's just stick with two, two things, and you'll, you'll see where this is going. Um, let's just start with our two involutions. Um, as David suggests, to consider the direct sum, we want to consider the intersection. So let's again think back to our example. We already argued, I already argued, and most of you nodded, that this was the pullback of the Jacobians under the horizontal one. Similarly, if you look at the, under this reflection, this is going to be the pullbacks. Well, what is the intersection of those? Well, we know that if a divisor is in the intersection, then this has to equal this, but it also has to equal that, and it has to be even and similar. So if you play with it, you convince yourself that the intersection is things where the three outer vertices are all the same and even, and things where the, the three inner ones are the same and even. But we also know that it has to be degree zero, right? If it's in here, it has to be of degree zero, because you're pulling back something of degree zero. So in other words, well, you look like this, and you're of degree zero, so you actually look like that. And now I claim, if we have a divisor on this graph that looks like this, let me just take this vertex and fire it s times. Right? That's going to send s, ver s chips here, s chips here, leave that with a zero. And then let me do that with both of the other things. And you end up with the zeros, the all zero defines. So in other words, in this example, any element that's in the intersection of the two involutions is actually equivalent to the trivial element in the Jacobian. Therefore, well, the intersection is just the trivial element, the zero element, which is enough to give us that the direct sum of the two subgroups is also a subgroup. Great. Well, luckily, the reason I'm able to talk about this is that this example isn't really all that special. Right. In general, let's assume that you have a graph that, where you have the two involutions so that the total quotient is a tree. Then you can actually get the same exact thing happening. That somehow, if you're in both of the intersections, then you're even, you have certain, you're constant on orbits is what happens, and you're even at the, on the orbits that have size 2n, or yeah, size n, rather. And so therefore, actually, you can just do the same thing where you just fire everything the right number of times. And it's actually a fairly easy exercise to show that you must, if you're in that intersection, you must be trivial. Therefore, the Jacobian, the sum of the two Jacobians is subgroup. Um, well, what happens if you're not trivial? What happens if the down, so what I've just proven, just to go over, is right, if this is a tree, then the sum of these two groups is a subgroup up here. 
What happens if this isn't a tree? Well, you get actually something you know, pretty similar that the intersection of two Jacobians can be viewed as a pullback of something in the Jacobian down here. And again, this is all just an exercise in writing down those M fees and tracing out what they all mean, all the horizontal ramification. But the idea is if you're in the intersection of these two things, then you're actually in the Jacobian of this. So, in other words, so actually I, I realized as I was going over this right before I head over here, there's a type, another typo here. I don't mean to say this is subjective. I just mean that the rest. So in other words, the Jacobian of the full quotient injects into the sum of those two, which then in, it maps into here. So I mean, that's what I mean to say. That last subjection should not be there. Um, so that's really helpful, right? This is starting to look a lot like the Connie and Rosen theorem. One question that I, I still can't really figure is, does it split? And I don't really know if splitting is the right word here, right? But in other words, could I say, therefore, that the sum of these two things is in the direct sum of these two things, um, right? Which is essentially the splitting level. Um, and I, we don't know. We tried to play with it, but we were an algebraic geometer and a graph theorist, and this was getting into algebra. So. so that's the first two. What about the third quotient? Well, oh, I guess before I do that, let me just, well, I'll, you know, I'll get to that in one second. Let's just say we have the set of pullbacks from this first quotient up here, the set of pullbacks from this, this quotient up here. What about their sum? What if you look at the elements that are the sum of those two, in the sum of those two? And you can prove a result that it says, it gives exact conditions for when a divisor on top can be broken down as the sum of two pullbacks. Um, there's three conditions you need to have happen. The first one is what I think of as a global condition, and I'm actually not going to worry about that right now. I'll put it up there. I can talk to anyone who wants to later. Um, but there's some global condition on the whole thing. And then the other two conditions just have to do with the orbits. If you have an orbit of order 2n, then you need that somehow the divisor on one half of it, and I, I, the notation is set up so that somehow the idea is that I don't have a picture right here of one that has 2n. Um, that you somehow have, you know, the x's are all rotationally equivalent, and then the y's are all rotationally equivalent, and the reflections switch the x's and y's. And the idea is that the divisor has to have the same sum on the x half of any orbit and the y half of any orbit. And similarly, if you have only an order n, then the divisor has to be even, if you look at it, all that full divisor. Um, so, the question, and this is getting to David's question again, is, well, when is this also in the third group? Well, the third group is the things that are rotationally equivalent, right? So in other words, if you're in, if you satisfy these conditions and you're sort of up the same up to rotation, that says all the x's have to be the same and all the y's have to be the same. And that then is going to say, well, if the sum of all the x's is the sum of all the y's, this is just n copies of the same thing, that's just n copies of the same thing, then you're left with just something where all of every, on the full orbit you're constant. In the other case, is the one that's more interesting, if you're rotationally equivalent and the sum uh, is even, then that's saying that this is just n times one divisor, and you get an even number. Well, if n is odd, then that just tells us that, right, then that tells us that the number we actually started with had to be even. You have an odd number times an even number, and so the original one was even. In, in other words, if n is odd, you can actually then show that you can then fire things the right number of times so that delta, our divisor, will be in this intersection if and only if delta is actually still in the pullback down here. If n is even, then something that's a little different, because you could have odd, and you know, even number times an odd is even. So you can have odd values on some of these orbits. And in fact, what you can show is that, is the following result. Let's say you have the natural surjective map from the direct sum of these three subgroups to just their sum, right? And David's question earlier is, you know, these two will be the same if everything's disjoint. But this isn't, the, in general, the case. If n is odd, then the curl here of this map is going to be isomorphic to two copies of the downstairs thing. 
One is the one we already dealt with from these two, and one is the new one we get from this middle thing. This is starting, this is actually exactly what Connie and Rosen said, right? They have two copies of the downstage thing. Um, if n is even, well, then you, unfortunately, you get a bunch of Zmod 2s lying around also. So we'll see those Zmod 2s show up again in a minute. Um, but so anyway, so this relates the direct sum of the three things to just their sum. So then the next question is, well, how does the sum of the three things relate to the Jacobian of the whole thing that we really wanted? You know, is there, what have we missed? Is the way I think of it, right? What's the co-kernel here? The sum of these three things, not direct sum, but the sum, actually adding the elements, is honest to God a subgroup of this. Well, how much have we missed? Well, the idea here is that the Jacobian is the set of divisors up here up to an equivalence relation that's almost the same as the Laplacian. So, uh, again, I'm, I'm starting to rush a little bit because of time, but um, so please slow me down. The idea is that the Laplacian said we're allowed to fire any vertex and be equivalent. What's happening here is somehow this is saying, well, we're allowed to fire any two vertices at the same time that are symmetric according to sigma one, right? So I can fire these two if I fire them at the same time. And I can fire these two if I fire them at the same time. Um, and, you know, in this case, that actually turns out to be, you know, most of what's happening. The idea is that this, this sum here, we're allowed to fire any single vertex in an orbit of size n. We're allowed to fire any pair that are in the same orbit but are mirrors of each other, they're mirror images, or we're allowed to fire all of the vertices that are rotationally equivalent simultaneously. So just to maybe show an example where this comes up, let, let's see this graph right here. In L, the Laplacian, you can fire any vertex. In this L prime, you can fire any of the X vertices by themselves, just fine. The Y vertices, if you fire a Y vertex, you have to also fire a Z vertex or fire all of the y's simultaneously. Okay. Um, this, this took us a little while to get used to, but the idea is that somehow, right, in this, in this Laplacian of the, the pullback business, there's, now sometimes you actually can fire other things because they fall out of this, but in general, you can't. In general, the idea is that this, this pullback Laplacian, the sum of the three, well, the divisors that you can pull that you can't pull back are the z mod n's of the t. So for each orbit of size t, or sorry, for each orbit of size 2n, right, I think I've said it a few times now, you, you can pull you have to you have to either fire all the y's or fire a y plus an x. I, you know, it, it was useful to us to look at this picture where we just sort of think, well, d is the set of divisors of degree zero. D mod L is the Jacobian of the full graph. The sum of these three, the divisors that are the pullbacks here, are P, which is sort of the, everything that is the pullback of the three, modulo this L prime that I just talked about. And so what I'm interested in is, well, this is certainly a subgroup of that. P mod L prime is certainly a subgroup of D mod L. What's its quotient? And, well, you can do some, throw this into various isomorphism theorems that a good abstract algebra student can do and play with a little, and you can see that, well, this is actually the same as d mod p mod l mod l prime. So I'll pull it to the other side. Well, l mod l prime, that's the, the set of divisors that you get from firing everything modulo this weird thing where you can fire x's and y's together, we know what that looks like. That's z mod n to the t, is what I just called that. The other thing, so, there. we can also compute. And that's, you know, again, a, 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 you know, a technical calculation that says, well, what divisors can you get up here by adding things you pull back from all three? And I can give you explicit formulas like that one I gave you before for the, in the two case. Um, and in particular, you could prove that d mod p is z mod n to the t plus 1 if n is odd. But if n is even, then you get these 
S minus 1 copies of Z mod 2 floating around as well. Well, and again, you prove this just by doing explicit constructions. There's both, there's very explicit conditions you can give. Um, so in other words, the Jacobian of G modulo the sum, the th sum of the three Jacobians is just Z mod N if N is odd. And if N is even, well, you have a Z mod N plus a Z mod 2 to the S minus 1. But remember, a minute ago, we said, so that sort of is the relationship between the full Jacobian and the sum of the three. A minute ago, we said that if you look at the difference between the sum of the three and the direct sum, you get just G mod D to the N squared if N is odd. And if N is even, you get these S minus 1 extra Z mod 2s. And of course, exactly those two things are the same. Now, as I said at the beginning, this is still slightly work in progress. Uh, you know, what we would like to be able to say is, therefore, that those cancel out. Well, they certainly do up to counting, right? You can write down exact sequences and up to sort of the orders of these things, this works out. But, and in certain cases, we can prove that these exact sequences split. Um, in the case where you just have n copies of the same graph uh, with an involution that I alluded to as my first is a family of examples, we can prove that they split and get the exact result that we wanted. Oh, but in general, we, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, but as a corollary to this, if n is odd and the full quotient is a tree, then we see that the Jacobian of the full of the three quotients here, the sum, direct sum of the Jacobians of the three quotients, is a subgroup of the Jacobian of the top. And, which is what we want, right? That's what Connie Rosen predicts should happen in general. Also, Connie and Rosen just say that the, that the maps, the groups are isogenous, that there's a kernel, a finite kernel. And Connie and Rosen's method gives no hope of saying exactly what that finite kernel will look like. Well, that's overstatement, but it does not give a lot of hope. In this case, I can tell you exactly what that quotient is. It's a copy of Z mod N. So, in other words, we get a very explicit right, thing going on. Now, this, uh, this exact sequence that you might write down here does not split, right? And we saw that example way at the beginning. When we looked at the example here, we said that the three quotients were Z mod 3, Z mod 3, Z mod 2, and Okay, wait, in that case, it is going to split, right? So in that case, and the full thing was Z mod 3, Z mod 3, Z mod 6. And so in that case, actually, it does split. In other cases, it doesn't split. If you put squares on either side here, it doesn't split. Uh, so, but we can get this. So just as a nice, quick example, a, a final example, I want to conclude with, Think of that circling graph C12. So remember, this is take n points around the circle, connect everything to its neighbor and to the thing 2 on either side. Okay. Well, G mod dn, the dihedral action, is a single point. All the vertices come together. So certainly that's a tree. And, so, and the Jacobian of the, the rotation, even, is enough to make everything come together. So that's Jacobian's trivial. You can also prove that if you look at the reflection, if n is odd, if you look at the reflection automorphisms, you get something that, so we have, right, so I have that, that. If you look at the reflections, then you can compute that you actually do get a cyclic Jacobian, of, if you modulate out by the reflection, and that in this case, it's F5, or Z mod F sub 5. You get the Fibonacci numbers showing up. So in other words, you can actually prove that the Jacobian in this case of the circulant graph is, well, two copies of Z mod F sub n up to another copy of Z mod n. And that the quotient is a Z mod n. And in fact, this works whether or not n is odd or even, just the proof is a little different. So, thank you very much for listening. Any comments or questions?
I have not. I'm trying to think. So you're saying, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I, I guess what I, I mean. Right. Geometry is another way that people are approaching this, and why, you know, one of the inspirations for this analogy between graph to graph theory and the algebraic geometry is what's really lurking down there. Um, and that's a good question, but I'm not, I don't have a good answer. Anything else? Okay. Well, let's thank Darren again.